Today, we're going to be creating this particular looping animation. It's an abstract sci-fi scene. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. In our default scene, we're actually going to keep the default cube. We're going to tab to go into edit mode, hit two to select the edges and just select all of the edges except for the bottom left and bottom right edges. Once you've selected all of them, we're just going to hit X, delete edges. And now we should have two edges remaining. We can grab that on the Z axis. Make sure you press control and just lift it up so that it comes to size zero. And then we can just scale it on the Y axis, press control and just click and drag so that we get two long lines. We can also scale them on the X axis to move them apart and move them around till we get them where we want. To know exactly where we want them, we're gonna take our camera, press Alt G and Alt R to clear location and rotation, then R X 90 to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees, G Y to grab it on the Y axis and just press control and move it back. Then press zero on the numpad to go into the camera view and then grab it on the Z axis, move it up, just a little bit and then again grab it on the Y and just move it back so that we have a nice positioning for our camera. Once we have the nice positioning of the camera, we're going to press Shift A, Mesh, Circle to add in a circle. Then we can rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees. We can also press Control 2 to give it a subdivision surface of level 2. Then grab it on the Z axis, press Control and just move it up by a little bit and then grab it on the Z axis a little bit more. Then we can actually scale it up by a little bit if necessary, but we'll deal with all of that in a second. This is going to be our main position. We're going to have cubes coming out from these two lines. So what we can do is extend the lines so that it goes till it actually touches or appears to touch the circle. So let's just scale on the Y axis and just scale it up. And you see it's touching the circle. So I know that that is a good length. Once we have that set, we can go and use geometry nodes to create the cubes. So let's click and drag from the junction of these two windows to open a new window, change it to the geometry node editor, and then press new to create a new geometry node tree. Right now we have two long lines. We don't want them to just be two long lines. So we're going to press shift A and search for a mesh to curve node and place the mesh to curve node right there. So now there are two curves. Now we can resample the curve so that we can just get as many points as we want. So we're just going to increase the counts, maybe something like 500 for a start. Now we can place our cubes on it. So for that, we're going to have to search for an instance on points node and place that right over here. Now we actually need a cube to be instanced. So let's search for a cube and just place that in to the instance over here. So right now, all of the cubes are the exact same size. If you actually scale them down, you'll notice that they're not exactly cubes. They're stretched out. So if you see once we've scaled it down and you zoom in, you see they're scaled on the Y axis because the actual object was scaled on the Y axis. To fix that, we can press Control A and apply scale. So now they actually become cubes. So now we can go back to our camera view and just increase the scale on the X and Y to something like 0.2. And on the Z, we can just increase it to maybe something like 2 so that we have these fairly long on the Z axis. Now we actually have to give them random rotations. So we can do that by actually changing the rotation over here. Let's search for a random value node and we have to change the type from float to vector because the rotation is on the X, Y and Z axes. Now let's actually connect this value into the rotation and it's going to go crazy, but that's not exactly what we want. So we don't want it to rotate about the Z axis initially. So we're just going to press zero and we can actually make all of these zero for now. Now we can change the min value on the X axis and see what rotation is actually happening. So we can change the min value to maybe minus one and the max value to plus one so that we have some rotation happening over there. Now on the Y value, we can go ahead and just rotate it a bit on this side. So let's go with minus 0 0.9 and rotate it here as well by 0 0.9. Now we have the actual rotations. So now we have to get these scales to rotate such that some of them are really high and some of them are really short. Along with that, some of them should be fat and some should be thin. So we're going to add in a random value node to the scale, but we don't need them to be vectors. So let's just search for a random value node. And the problem is we need control over the X and Y separately and the Z separately. So we're going to search for a combined X, Y, Z node, and we're just going to place that in over here and put the vector into the scale. Now for the X and Y values, we're going to use the same random value that we're generating over here. Of course, we can play around with the seed and we can change the min to something like 0.1 to get really thin lines and uh, for nothing and the max to maybe something like 0.8. Now for the Z, we're going to search for a separate random value node. Let's just duplicate it with shift D and now change the min to one and the max to something like 
3 and now place this value into the z. So now we have quite a bit of action happening. Maybe we can reduce the scale a little bit, increase the max thickness by a little bit, reduce the minimum height also, so the minimum z by a little bit. And there we have fairly random objects. So right now we don't want to see anything below the baseline. So let's add in a plane and just scale it till it comes outside our cubes and then scale it on the y-axis till it actually covers up the entire cube. So you can press seven on the numpad to go to the top view and just scale it accordingly. Once you've scaled it to cover up the entire distance, we can go ahead and press Ctrl A, apply scale so that we don't get any problems during the shading. Lastly, for our circle that we added in over here, we have to give it some thickness. So let's go to the modifiers tab and add in a skin modifier. Now the skin modifier is far too thick. So let's just tab to go into edit mode, press one to go into the vertex select mode, press A to select all the vertices. You won't be able to see anything because it's covered by the skin modifier. And if you do want to see it, you can switch on transparency or you can switch on the wireframe view over here. However, we're going to keep it in solid view and we'll just switch on transparency for now, just so that you can see it. Now we're going to press Control A and just move our mouse down till we get a circle size that we like. So I like something like this and that would be fine. Now we can switch off transparency and this is our circle. I think I'm just going to grab it on the Z axis and move it up by a little bit. And there we have it. Now we can go ahead and start our shading. Before we start our shading, we're just going to go to our render properties and set all of our shading defaults. We're going to switch on ambient occlusion, bloom, and screen space reflections. Along with that, under our bloom, we're just going to change the intensity from 0.05 to 0.02. Now we can go to our material properties and change this to a viewport shading of rendered switch off overlays and change this bottom window from the geometry node editor to the shader editor. Also in our geometry node editor, let's just make sure that at the end of everything, after we instance on points, we can just set the material from here. So let's just add in a set material node and change the material to the default material that's already present. Now we can go ahead and change it to the shader editor. So now in our shader editor, the first thing that we're going to do is add in the material for our ring. So let's just select the ring and press new to add in a new material. Let's remove the principal BSDF and let's search for a gradient texture and an emission shader. Let's plug the emission into the surface and increase the strength to something like 10. Now for the gradient, let's search for a color ramp and just place that in, take the color, it into the factor and the color into the color. Now if you actually take a look at the gradient, it starts from this far side. We don't want that. So let's press Control T. Make sure you have Node Wrangler switched on from your Edit Preferences add-ons Node Wrangler. If that's not there, just search for the mapping and coordinate nodes and add them in. Change it to Object and now you have it perfectly from the center. Now in order to get a nice smooth gradient, we're going to change this to B spline and we're going to move the black in all the way towards the white. Place it somewhere like this and we're just going to change the location till we get something that we are happy with. So this is what I'm going with. Now we're going to change the color of the black from black to green and the white we're going to change from white to blue. Also we don't want it to be perfectly straight like this so we're just going to rotate it on the Z a little bit and remember this is the object's Z we had rotated it so it's just going to rotate a little bit and now we can play around till we get the positioning as we want. The next thing is we're going to change from object to world and play around with the world settings. So we're just going to reduce the color of the world, not all the way to black, almost black and give it a nice bluish color. So something like this should be fine. Now we have to play around with the actual light. We have one light in the scene. Let's press Alt G to clear its location. Then grab it on the X axis, move it a bit to the side and then just grab it on the Z axis so that it moves up just a little bit. We can switch on our overlays to see exactly where it is. So make sure that it's just below our circle. Then we can shift D and then press shift Y so that it doesn't move on the Y axis and just move it till it's just above our green. So the one that's above our green, we're going to change that color to green. And the one that's just below our blue, we're going to change that one's color to blue. Now we want these to only help light up our scene. We don't want it to affect anything. So we can switch off specular and volume for both the lights. Switch off specular, switch off volume. Also the radius, we're going to change it from 0.1 to 0.25 on both of them. So once you have that, we're just going to select them and we're just going to shift D Y, move it back by 10 units and then shift D Y, move it in front by 20 units, which is 10 units in front as well. Now we can play around with the power, change the power of each of them to 100, except for the main two. And now we can go ahead and give the material to the floor and the cubes. So for the cubes, we're going to change from world to object. And we had already set it up with the default material. Let's just go ahead and increase the metallic to something very close to one and just reduce the roughness as well to something really, really low. 
So this seems about fine. A roughness of 0 0.15 and a metallic value of 0 0.98. Similarly, we're going to take our floor, add in a new material, and now we're going to increase the metallicness so that it's very close to one again. But for the roughness, we're going to play around with a color ramp and a noise texture. Let's search for a noise texture. Plug the color into the factor of the color ramp and the color into the roughness. Now again, you can't quite see the scale of the color ramp because it's using the stretched coordinates. We don't want it to be stretched. So let's control T with the node wrangler switched on and change to the object coordinates. Now we'll change the scale to something like 0.3 and we're just gonna increase the black so that we get a nice contrast. And along with that, we're just gonna increase the roughness of the detail to something like 0.8 and we're gonna increase the detail to something like eight. So now we have rough patches and really shiny patches as well, but we want a little bit more to happen on the floor. We're gonna search for a brick texture and we're gonna use the same vector coordinates as the vector. Now we're just gonna control shift click the brick texture so that we see it and you see it's way too small so let's increase the scale or decrease it to 0 0.8 we don't want the frequency to be 2 so we're going to switch the offset all the way to 1 change the frequency to 1 and for the brick width we're just going to reduce it and maybe reduce the scale as well so that we just get roughly square bricks now the mortar size we also don't want it to be this fat so we're just going to reduce it till it's a very small value now we want both the colors to be white or at least very similar let's keep it at this and with this we're going to search for a bump node and we're going to place a color into the height and the normal into the normal of the principal bsdf and then control shift click the principal bsdf so that we actually see it remember control shift clicking helps us preview the nodes that's also a feature of node wrangler and there we have our floor as well that's that it looks like it. there are bumped tiles you can play around with it a little bit if you want okay so now i'm just going to select our circle again and increase the strength to something like 50 because i like that better and now we'll go to our render properties and also clamp the bloom at something like 10 i've increased the emission to 100 so now we're going to go ahead and switch on overlays and just select our camera once we have our camera selected we can go to our camera settings viewport display passport out all the way to one so that we see only what's in our camera view and then we're going to switch on depth of field. We're going to press the arrow key to expand it. Click on focus on object and just select our circle. That's always focused on the circle and the F stop. We're going to decrease all the way to 0 0.1. Now let's just switch off overlays and look at what it is. And now we're going to slowly increase the F stop till we get something that we like. Let's try 1.2, 1 1.5, 1 1.8. And I think 1.8 is what I'm liking the best, but we're going to keep it at 1.8 for now. The next thing is the actual animation. So in order to do the animation, I'm going to go and set our animation defaults. So let's go to the output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. Let's, in, let's change the end frame to 300 so that it's a 10 second long animation. Change the output folder to whatever you want. Double slash saves it to the same folder your current file is saved in. Change the file format to FFmpeg video. Encoding container, change it to MPEG4 and the output quality to perceptually lossless. So once you have that set, we can go ahead and change the shader editor to the graph editor and also increase the timeline just a little bit so that we have both in view. With our camera selected on frame one, let's press I, location, rotation, scale, add in the keyframe. Then let's go to something like frame 150 so that we're halfway through the animation and then grab it on the Y axis and just move it through our sphere and you see the sphere is how many units away. So we actually have to look at location of our camera. The location is minus 15. If you actually grab it on the Y axis by 15 units, we would be at the circle. So we should actually change the location to 15, which means we have to move it by 30 units and then press I location rotation scale, but also rotate it on the Z axis by 180 degrees so that it's facing our circle and then press I location rotation scale. So now we have all of the curves in our graph editor. Let's expand the object transforms and just switch off everything except for the Z rotation because we want this to rotate exactly when we cross the circle. So to do that, let's first select our handles and just grab it and move it on the X axis and take this handle, grab it, move it on the X axis till they actually come close to each other. We also want to scale them up so that we get like smoother motion. So let's scale it by two and select this one also and scale it by two, so S two. And now we're just gonna grab and move it to the point where we're actually crossing the circle. So let's just grab it and move it on the X axis and see what it is. At 75, I believe we should be exactly halfway through. So let's grab it on the X and just move it. And there you have it perfectly go and rotate just as it's 
crossing the circle. So that's the exact animation that we were looking for. Also, under playback, just change from play every frame to frame dropping so that we have an accurate idea of how fast the animation is. Otherwise, you might think it's going at a perfect speed, but it might be too slow. So that's perfect. Now let's go ahead and place our cursor at 150. Shift D1 so that we get a duplicate of all of the keyframes that are shifted by exactly one unit. And then scale minus one that they actually rotate. And then just G2 so that it just moves by two units. So now it'll stop for exactly two frames over here. And because we have a keyframe repeating at 301, it'll stop for exactly one frame at the start. So it is perfectly looping. It stops for a frame here and it stops for a frame there. You can remove that if you want, but I want it to stop for a frame. Now, the thing is that if you see it when it rotates, it rotates towards the green side. And again, while rotating for the second time, it rotates through the green side again. I don't want that. I want it to rotate towards the blue side the second time while coming back. So what we're going to do is we're just going to select this second handle and we're going to move it up. So right now it's coming back to zero. That's why it's rotating back. But we want it to rotate and move to 360. So we're going to grab it Y axis and type 360. So now when you actually watch it, it goes to the blue side. So now it's like you're going to be rotating in a loop. You're going to rotate towards the green side. And while coming back, you're going to rotate towards the blue side. That's exactly what I wanted and I'm happy with it. The last few things that I want to do just before rendering this out is go back to the shader editor and make a few changes. So here I feel like the blue is too small and it should move a bit higher. So we can just change the X location such that we get a better ratio. The next thing is our actual cubes. I want to change its material a little bit as well and just add in a little bit of bump. So let's search for a Voronoi texture and I can plug that into the roughness or add in some bump. So let's just see what it looks like in the roughness. Let's go ahead and just increase the scale. We can search for a color ramp as well and just plug that in so that we have more control. And you can actually see how it's all stretched out in different regions. We don't want that stretching. So again, control T to add in a texture coordinate in mapping nodes and just change it to object. Next thing, maybe a little bit of bump will help. So let's just search for a bump node and plug this color into the height and the normal into the normal. So once you do that, you just get a little bit more detail on these cubes. And I think that just adds to it. You can play around with the scale if necessary. So there you have this perfectly looping animation. And you can use this in various ways, backgrounds, and just play around and have fun with it. Hopefully you learned something and I hope these tutorials are useful. If you do find them useful, please subscribe, share them around, hit the like and comment whatever questions you might have because I will respond to all of your questions. And until next time, don't forget to stay creative.